Today we are talking about this triple Dresden tree skirt. This was probably one of the first things I ever demoed in our store when we first opened. And I demo it every Christmas and every Christmas, everybody loves it. Um, it's fun, it's cool as you go. It's easier than it looks with a couple of tools. This makes a perfect circle when you get it all done. There is the smallest bit of bias on the middle part here, but I'm gonna give you a trick for that because I know how the word bias makes you go, I get it. Um, we have two kits this year. Every year I do a green and red option, which we have a green and red option again this year. And then I always do a non-traditional colorway. This year we're doing silver and blue. And so those are the colors that I'm gonna demo this technique with. But a couple of features of this project is, like I said, it's quilt as you go. So the back is made at the same time as the front. There's lots of ways to embellish this, but I'm gonna show you the technique for not only getting this to look like a perfect circle, but making sure that things don't migrate on you. So if you've never done a Quilt As You Go project, this is a really great one to start with. So in your kit, you get the pattern. You'll get six shades of blue fabric, and then we have six shades of silvers and white. The pattern gives you a template if you want to make your template on paper. The reason I don't suggest that is because not only do you need to take and draw this out and tape it together, you would have to cut out about 121 squares or tri um, triangles, and I just don't want to do that. So this ruler here, this 15 degree ruler, which was designed by the same person that designed the pattern, coincidence, I think not. Um, this is gonna make that process go a whole lot easier. So the pattern tells us what size strips we need to cut. So I am layering up all my blue fabric first and I'm gonna cut that size strip. So I've got my strip set that we're gonna start with. Now we're gonna do this same technique both with the blue fabric and with the silver fabric, the pattern's gonna tell you where you need to line up all of your angles. So she tells us what line to line up on our top. And just to double check yourself, she tells you to line up what, what number on the ruler we're gonna line up on the top and then double check and make sure that that's the, the corresponding one is at the bottom. And we're going to cut up one side of the ruler and then down the other side. So the reason that the ruler makes everything so much easier is you literally just stack them, cut strip sets, and then cut your angles out of them. Okay, so this is six. We need 24 total wedges. I'm gonna go ahead and cut all the rest of the pieces that I need, again, with this technique, but based on the pattern in the ruler, because based on where you line up in the angle will give you whatever degree bottom that you need. Your backing pieces are made out of really long, wide strips. So I'm just gonna show you a quick cutting tip for getting really wide strips. I took my piece of fabric and I pressed a strong seam in the fold. So now I have the raw edges out here and I've just lined the edge up and cut just that fold off. And then using my mat, I have a mat that I can trust the measurements on. I'm just gonna cut my other strip on this end. And then I'm gonna show you a trick on getting these big wedges cut. Now when we cut these backing pieces, we're gonna use actually the top part of the ruler. So that part, this is probably the easiest of the cuts. The other ones you find different lengths in the edge of the ruler. But we're gonna line the very top of this ruler up and cut down the side. Now to get your first cut, you need to flip your ruler. Um, and so I'd basically turn the whole piece of fabric around to get the other side of your cut. 
and you're going to cut same thing down one side up the other down one side up the other and when you cut your backing pieces you should have a pretty decent sized chunk left at the end hold on to this because this is what we're going to bind it with okay so it only took me about 15 minutes and i cut out all of the pieces for the tree skirt you've got a pile of batting so we'll talk a little bit about batting um I didn't put batting in these kits for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of us have big piles of scraps of batting laying around from quilting quilts. Two, it would have made the package really big and fluffy. Um, and I was trying to keep the cost down on the kit. So if I will, I will uh, put a tag of a batting that's the right size and the right thickness for this kit. So if you need to add batting, you can. Um, I like using the Quilters Dream Angel batting because it's really thin. It's just the right thickness. You don't really want something thick and fluffy in this because you got a lot of layers to put together and you want them to lay flat when they're done. If you are going to use scraps of batting you already have, try to make sure you're consistent. So try to make sure they're all the same thickness and the same um, makeup. You don't want to mix 80-20 with cotton and wool and it would just look a little funky if you did that. What I find is best practices for making wedges is to fold them in half, raw edges together, and then sew from the raw edge, not from the fold. If you start sewing from the raw edge, I'm just using my quarter inch foot. If you start sewing from the raw edge and sew off the fold, you don't have to find the middle. Gravity is going to find the middle for you. We're just going to stack up all of our Dresden points and we're going to sew all the tips together. Now I have a whole pile of these put together, okay? Now this is my favorite little tool for when I have these long chains. This is called a blade saver thread cutter and you literally just pop them apart. It's like instant gratification. When we get to this step, we are going to turn, we're going to clip these. Again, when I clip my Dresdens, I put my scissors about halfway up my seam. I don't want to poke out my seam. About halfway up my seam and cut it on, on an angle. Okay, so that takes up most of the bulk away. And then I'll put my thumb inside the point, put my pointer finger together and flip them right way out. So again, when I automate all my steps, I cut them all apart, I snip them all, I turn them all. And then when I get them to this point and I have a pile of them like this, I get my point turner, get my point turner and my prairie, point, my prairie pointer. And I poke all these points out really nice, get them as sharp as you can. And after I have a whole pile of them that look like this, all four sizes, I'm going to take this to my iron and we're going to use our prairie pointer. Now my prairie pointer, this is my favorite tool for making Dresdens. It's metal and you can poke it all the way up into that point and then iron it. Um, the first thing I learned about using my prairie pointer was get your fingers out of the way and put something on it that you can pull it out without touching it because it gets hot. All right, so a couple of other points as some tips to put this together. Remember that 15, this is a 15 degree angle. There's 24 of them, which is going to make 360 degrees, therefore a circle. So you want to make sure that you, this is in the middle. If your points are not angled correctly, your circle is not going to be a circle. It's not going to line up right. So for an extra little tip, when you're pressing these Dresdens, I like to use flatter spray, but I put it in one of these fine mist bottles and I'll just line up five or six of my Dresdens and just lightly mist the point part of it before I use my prairie tool, my prairie pointer. Because then what happens is as you line up your prairie pointer, it sort of shifts into place and then you can line up your seam and then when you press this the steam that comes from it comes from the for comes from the flatter and it will make a really not only a really sharp point but it lays really flat 
All right, so what I've got now is all my backing pieces are these really long ones. My large wedges, medium wedges, small wedges, and batting wedges. All right, so now we're gonna start building this. The first set of wedges that we do is a little bit different than the rest because that's because we're getting started. Since this is a quilt as you go technique, we're gonna take our backing piece. It's very important that you build these in order. So we put our smallest piece on first, and I'm gonna give you some tips to make sure everything lines up evenly, okay? So line up your bottom piece. Make sure this is really flat. Now the hardest part is figuring out where this middle one goes. Theoretically, it's hard. But you'll see if you put it up here, you can see the backing. And if you put it down here, you can see the back of your mat. So you kind of just move this until it clicks into place like a puzzle. Okay, and when this is in the right place, a couple you'll see a couple of things. One, your piece lines up with your wedge. You shouldn't see any of the folded part of the Dresden on the bottom one. Then you take your large one and you match it up with the point up here. Okay, now a couple of things that I like to do when I'm putting this particular project together. I will pin, I like to use these really long thin clover pins because they lay flat and they're long but they don't bend as easy as some of the other long pins do and since we're going to go through lots of layers sometimes these ones work a little bit better what i'm going to do is i'm going to pin my point and i'm going to put a pin here and here because i want now that i've got these all lined up perfectly i don't want them to move when i go to the machine we also need to put our batting piece in, and we need to do that after these are pinned together. So I'm gonna pick up the whole sandwich, and I'm gonna line it up so that my batting lines up perfectly with the bottom of my wedge. And same thing with the batting. When the batting is in place, you can't see it. You shouldn't be able to see the batting this side or this side or at the bottom. So this is a really good time for your walking foot. For a couple of reasons you're stitching through multiple layers and you don't want these layers to shift we are going to sew with a quarter inch seam allowance my walking foot has these marks on it that show me my quarter inch the quarter inch part isn't as crucial in this process as it is when you're doing say quilted triangles but you do want to have it be consistent because if it's not consistent your wedges aren't going to be uniform in their shape and then they're not going to be a circle at the end. So I'm going to drop my foot. I'm going to take about two or three stitches and then I'm going to back stitch it. So I do want to lock these stitches in place because as we turn them, you don't want your stitches to come apart. What that does is it stops your stitches from coming apart and you also don't have thread tails at the end. So you can't see them when you're all done. So we're going to sew this seam. Now on this first pass, we're gonna press it just a little bit differently because we don't have anything to attach to it yet. I'm gonna set my seam and I'm gonna press my wedges open one at a time because I wanna make sure that they lay really flat. It's sort of like the pages of a book and press each one out. Now you'll know you didn't do this the right direction if when you flip these open, your little one's not on top. Ask me how I learned that. So you need to make sure that when you're building them, you're building them in the right direction so that when you flip them over, they come out the right way. I'm gonna press them all to this side and then I'm gonna open it like a book. And I'm gonna pull them over so that they line up over here. This is a good time to use those pins again because you wanna make sure that this stuff stays flat before you add your next um, your next layers. Since this is a quilt as you go process, you want to make sure that your layers are staying flat. Okay, so I'm going to flip them over one at a time and I'm going to pin them in place. 
Then I want to make sure that I press this seam and I want this seam to be really, really flat. If you get to here and you see anything sticks out weird, like this is a little bit off, I'm going to repin that because I really want these points to line up as close to perfect as possible. If you, you want to make sure that this first wedge that you start is correct. There's 24 wedge pieces. So for the next 22 of them, they're all going to be built just like this. We lay our batting down. We lay our backing piece on top of our batting. Make sure that the bottom of your batting isn't showing and that the sides of your batting isn't showing. Make sure it's all tucked up underneath there. Okay. Scratch it around till it gets where it needs to be. Then you're going to take the unit you've already made and you're going to put your batting piece, your backing pieces together. Make sure your bottom wedge lines up and make sure this top end lines up. These two points are really important. Even if you have to really, you really just have to force it to happen, force it to happen because if you start to let this bottom line get off in any way, it just becomes exponentially worse as you go around the circle. Then we're going to take and try to, now if you're really particular about how your fabrics lay out and you wanna make sure that there aren't two next to each other or you wanna make sure your pattern repeats, so you have six fabrics. So if you want to have a pattern to how your fabric repeats, then pay attention as you're putting them together. So make sure, and you know, if you want these together, this is your thing. It doesn't matter to me. So if you want these two fabrics to match, then go ahead. If you want to make it look like big pie wedges, you can. You're going to match up your smallest piece first. What I like to pay attention to is that my points here line up and my bottom lines up. If that's the case, then go ahead and pin through that bottom piece. Add your middle wedge. Make sure this point ma matches up and that your sides match up. And if they do, then you can pin them. Now here, this is where this part really matters. What, what I do is when I put the top wedge together, can you see that? When you put the top wedge together, I like to clip all of those layers all at once because I want to make sure that all four of these points line up. Then I want to make sure that this point matches up with all four points and that this part matches up. And if it does, I like to pin it right here. And I put a clip at the top. Since we're not going to sew over here and I don't have to move the clip, I'll leave that there. And then we're going to sew all the way along this, this long seam again and make a sandwich. Now the way I like to press this is just like we did in the first go. I'm going to press my, my top layer, my middle layer, and my bottom layer open. So I'm going to press this layer first. Then I'm going to open it up again like a book. With those top ones pressed already, take your backing fabric and just sort of smooth it out and then give it a good press. There's that. We're going to do the same thing. We have a piece of batting. A backing. Okay, this is why I like the cotton batting because it kind of sticks to everything and you don't have to worry about it creeping on you too much. Okay, and so now this is what we have. We've got our first two wedges are built and our backing is put together and it's all stitched. All of your seams are encased in each other. Nothing's sticking out. It all looks really nice and copacetic. That is what we want. So, as you're building this around in the circle, make sure that your bottoms continually line up. Double check and make sure that this point lines up, that this point lines up, 
and that this point lines up before you start building your next set, set of wedges. So even if you have to put a clip here to hold this together until you start building the rest, that's fine, do that. I know it seems a little fussy, but it's better to be fussy at the beginning than fix it later, okay? So we'll go on again and we'll add our next layer. Make sure that this point matches this point, that this point matches that point, and that your bottom piece matches there. And you're just going to keep building this all the way around in this technique. You put the batting down, you put the backing down, you put your wedges down. So I'm about two thirds of the way through building my, my fans, okay? So I thought this is a good time to talk a little bit about tips. So one of the things that I do is as I'm building this, there's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. One, you wanna make sure that what's happening here in the middle is a circle. So if you start to see where you start to get little steps here, it's because your bottom pieces are migrating south. So I'm gonna show you a couple things to look for and if you see those things happen, you need to go back and fix it, okay? The other thing I do is this gets heavy because you got lots of layers of fabric, lots of layers of batting. So as you're going back and forth to your machine, this gets heavy. So what I will do is as I'm adding my layers, every you know three or four fans, I'll fold it over on itself like this and clip it. So I'll use my quilting clips to clip these together because otherwise the weight gets too much as you're going to your machine and that can cause distortions and problems too. So a couple things you wanna pay attention to when you're doing this. When you're adding your layers, make sure you're matching up the points here, both here and down here because if you keep these lined up with each other, it'll stay, the shape will stay all the way around. So see how these are lining up? If they're not, like if you get to one and this isn't lining up, take the seam out and reset it because once you start getting off the rails, it goes sideways really quickly. So see how these points are staying together here? It's a nice sharp shape. That's what you're looking for. If you get somewhere and you see this, you see where the batting is sticking out, Check and see if it's just that the batting's too big. So if you flip this over and you've pressed everything and everything's laying nice and flat and you flip it over and you can see the same amount of batting on the front as on the back, it's just the batting. So don't worry too much about that. If it makes you really itchy, you can cut that away. I usually don't, I usually just work around it. The other thing you can do is you're the boss. You can kind of steam this into submission to a certain extent. So if you're stitching along and you see that you're getting skip stitches, put a bigger needle in. So now I have a 90 Microtex needle in and I'm not having any problem at all getting through all these layers. Press it from the back. And look at how nice and smooth the backing is on this. I love this technique as a quilt as you go. So you don't actually see the quilting, but all of the sewing is gonna hold this whole thing together really nicely. So now we're at the last step. And whenever I taught this as a class, we'd get to this step and everybody go, huh? So on the very last blade, you just sew the top pieces on. You don't put the backing and batting on yet. You just sew the top three blades. Now that you've gotten used to doing everything upside down and backwards, we're gonna flip it on you just one more time. So you have your top blade sewn on just like you did all the rest of the time. You're gonna take your backing piece and lay it on top, always right sides together. We're gonna to line all our pieces up. Then we take our piece of batting and line it up. Okay, I'm gonna pin through all of my layers because I don't want this to shift either. We're gonna sew our quarter inch seam allowance and I will be right back to show you a pressing tip. Cool. So I sewed my backing piece and my batting on. I'm going to flip this over and press it toward the backing like we have in all the other steps. 
Make sure you're getting everything as flat as you can. This step is just my tip. It's not in the pattern. Um, there's the, the rest of the finishing parts of this is just how I do it. You can do it any way that you like to. But what we need to do now is take the whole shebang, flip it over, and we're going to take our backing piece now and we're going to flip it this way which means now we need to turn this under and sew it. We can top stitch it, we can stitch in the ditch, but I'm gonna show you my trick. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip this over, I'm gonna line up the edge of my seam, and I'm gonna give it a press. Now y'all know how I feel about closing up things, and if I can glue it, I will. So that's what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna press everything really flat, and then we're gonna to go to our cutting table. All right, so now at our cutting table, I'm gonna cut away the batting just to get it out of the way. So I'm gonna pull my batting piece up and lay just the batting on the table. Don't cut your backing away. This, that will make you unhappy. With a generous quarter inch, which means a quarter inch plus an eighth, so let's say three eighths of an inch here, I'm gonna cut away the edge of this batting because we don't really need it in the seam, okay? Take your backing back up, okay? We're gonna take our applastic tape here and we're gonna iron this down in that space where we cut away our batting. Okay, now this tape goes on with heat. I'm just gonna lay it here on the cutting table, but then we're gonna take it to our iron and we're gonna fuse this down. Okay, so use it. Okay, so I've turned off my steam for this step just so it doesn't make it any messier. And I'm just gonna fuse down my tape. The reason I like this tape is because it's sticky once you take the paper off and then you don't really have to mess with it. Now we wanna make a seam allowance, okay? Because we want this to tuck up under. So before I pull my tape out, I'm gonna use the paper as a guide to give me the quarter inch that I want. And with the paper still in there, it's a little bit more um, rigid, just so you can kind of get an idea of where that's gonna lay. All right, so I'm just gonna fuse that, or I'm gonna press that over, then I'm gonna pull my paper off. We're gonna do this twice. So we'll pull that off. And now it's, it's tacky. So I can just stick it down. You can press this stage if you want to. You don't actually have to because we're gonna press another piece of fusible on top of this. I just like when it gets really crispy and it lays really flat. So that's up to you. So you can go ahead and fuse this down or not, whatever you prefer. And then we're gonna take another layer of that tape and we're gonna put it on this seam that we just folded over. All right, so. Here's another bit of tape. I like to just make sure I know exactly where it's gonna stick before I hit it with the iron. I know, it's a crazy thought. Cut that off. We're gonna stick this to itself. Make sure you hit it with the iron real good so that the glue melts into the fabric. Now, what we've got is, oh, I still got batting in the way. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this and we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna fuse it down. I forgot that I had to do a seam allowance. We need to cut that a little bit smaller. It's been a minute since I made this. So we're gonna go and cut another quarter inch away from our batting. Now when I lay this over, my batting should tuck right up underneath here. So now you still have the same thicknesses of your batting. You don't have sort of a sort of a flat spot there. So take your batting and fluff it up underneath that seam allowance, under here. You can press it if you want to, but you probably don't need to. You probably can just pre you can just press it down. So now this is nice and flat. This is all flat. When we pull this paper off, now it's sticky. And we can take this and fold it over on top of this seam allowance right here. So the edge of your fold should match up with that seam line right there. You can even cover it if you don't want to see that stitching because you don't see that stitching anywhere else in the quilt as you go process. So I just kind of put it right over that thread line.
So our tree skirt, let's take all our clips off here. Our tree skirt is mostly done. Now we just need to bind this. So here's my tip for the binding. We've got this leftover chunk of fabric. When we cut our backing wedges, we've got this leftover chunk. It's not exactly a square because it's kind of on that 15 degree angle. That 15 degree angle isn't gonna mess you up enough that you can't get bias from here. We need to make sure that we can get, uh, let's say 24 inches worth of bias out of this piece of fabric. It's not exactly square, but it's square enough for the purposes that we need. I'm just gonna fold my edge over here, and this is gonna give us a bias. If you are really you know, fussy about it, you can always make a square out of this piece. You've got plenty of fabric here. You'll have to sew a seam, but you can straighten that side and get, it's, it's more like a rectangle, but you can get the, the 90 degree angle on it this way. So if you straighten up your edges and then fold your, your side over like this, now you have bias. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut myself two strips that are two inches wide out of this. Since these are opposite, you can just line these two edges up, mark your quarter inch, and sew your seam. That, that usually works fine for this application. So I'm just gonna sew this here to here, and I'm gonna show you how to, a quick and easy way to bind this. All right, so I sewed my two strips together. I'm just trimming off my dog ears here. I'm gonna press this open and so now what we have is just a, you know, kind of a quick and dirty way to have a little bit of um, bias tape. I really like using a bias tape maker for this step because I always burn myself when I try to fold these two pieces inside and get it lined up in the middle. So I have a one inch bias tape maker. I'm gonna pull my thread, my fabric all the way through here. I always like to get it started a little bit and make sure that my fabric's lining up and then I back it up so that I can make a nice straight tape. So I'm using some of my seam align glue so that I don't have to stitch this part. Just gonna put a little bit of glue. This glue sets with heat. So what it lets you do is kind of put things where you want them and make sure that they're where you want them before you stick it, stick it. So I'm gonna set that down. I wanna make a nice clean edge. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it with my iron so it dries. Okay. Now, the reason I like doing this kind of bias is because I can now just take my clean edge over here and my open part at the top and I can just fold it around the top of my piece here. Um, I get really nervous about sewing this part because I like it to line up exactly where I want it to go. So you can do a couple of things. You can either sew one side on, turn it around and hand stitch it, that's fine. You can sew it one side and turn it around and machine stitch it. That's okay too. I like to make sure this is going to sit where I want it before I do any of those things. So I'm going to put a little bit of my Apple stick tape. I'm going to take my skirt and match up the edges here. And I'm going to just sort of stick this in place.
Okay, so now I can take this and I can turn my edge under and it kind of stick in place while I'm doing the rest of my, um, my placements. Okay, now I've got that side stuck down. I'm gonna do the same thing with the other side. Now you can either take a clear thread or a matching thread and with your walking foot, just top stitch all the way along that part. All right, so here's our finished tree skirt. I already had the green and blue, green and red one made, but I thought this was a really fun color combination. Every year I try to make one that's a different blend of non-traditional colors, but I thought this would be kind of fun if, um, you have a different color in your decor. It's a little more winter and a little less Christmas. Um, yeah, so this is a really fun project. The secret to getting good success with this one is being fussy in the pinning and being fussy in laying everything out. If you do the work there, then the sewing part is easy. And I hope I gave you some tips that, would, that will help you with that. Mostly the tips I gave you is because of ways that we have screwed it up in the past that we don't want to screw it up this time. I think you should make one. I think everybody should make one. And then I think you should make them for your friends. So there you go. We'll see you later.